I was checking if, uh, if it is on the report. I will distribute uh, printouts for any comments. And, uh, when did you send it? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, maybe let me make some little of announcements, not announcements, suggestions. Uh, it, m if we track time for Aaron and s uh, check how long uh, uh, does it take to present, it would be helpful. Oh, it is the same problem be between Mac and PC. So just just in case, well, right, right now let's present whatever whatever it is, but. Uh, for final presentation, you may uh, get a screen capture of the whole slide and right. just paste it. Well, it'll be on my laptop. Yeah, yeah. Huh? You can convert it as a PDF? Not the old <coughs> thing, because he has some movies. You cannot oh. embed movies into PDF. Um, also, since we have only two speakers, we are not in big rush. Well, let me invite Aaron. To, to do uh, a little exercise. So before going to formal practice of you know, the overall talk, go to conclusion slide and pronounce it first. And then after after you um, present conclusions, go to the beginning and start as as you do in normal. Uh, the idea for this suggestion is comes from. Uh, the fact that 15 minutes is really short time. There will be big famous people before and after Aaron. Yes. And uh, I'm not sure that they will be generous enough to donate their time to Aaron. Could be, could be otherwise. And there is a, uh, from, from my own experience, there is a very big danger uh, of uh, getting stuck in the middle of the talk and not showing uh, the most uh, interesting parts. So you're, you're yet getting a little prepared, right? Yeah, I just... Okay, I'll, I'll make another uh, announcement that may sound silly, but who knows. So, uh, what are your main goal goals for attending the conference? Daniel knows the answer. <laughs> we were talking to him, but... Yes. Getting know the different dimensions of the your related research. Okay. Uh, and networking. Uh huh. <laughs> what is your main goal? Uh, I guess I'm not really sure what my main goal would be off the top of my head. I guess I haven't explicitly thought about it. Um, <laughs> you, you have a couple of minutes. <laughs> You're not going, so you, no. you, you, you don't need to have a goal. You're a lucky <laughs> man. It won't be easier, I don't know, if you convert your PDF in your laptop and then send to Dimitri again. I still, still have the issue of the movie, though. Oh. Well, oh, then uh, we can present from, your, the last, the from last your laptop. Oh, yeah, they have a connection to for iPad, too. Just I connect, have something connect I have, have, a, I have the adapter with me. Apple things. I don't know the exact. You can connect Apple to the server remotely. Uh, yeah. If you are not well, we do not have anyone on the, on the connection. It's able to do in our and two zero nine. If you do it only for, for the. the you don't need to connect by the wire. You can connect it remotely. Oh, through like Bluetooth or something. Um, it, it, uh, you get substantial degrading quality. Oh. Yeah. If you have wire, better use wire. <laughs> uh, there is also Apple TV where you can. Uh, and, and they get substantial degree in quality. Oh. <laughs> so is it, a, is it connection to the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, kind of like that? Both, they're both Wi -Fi kind of like And there could be... Okay, I'll stay entertaining. <laughs> Fatima, what is your goal? I'll let people know my research. Okay. You? Advertise. Advertisement. Okay. Okay. You, you've heard the opinions. Now, star of today's show, 
Daniel Ramirez, what is your goal? Uh, to get feedback from your paper, I mean, from your poster. Right? So, um, advertising networking is super cool, but there is a, a practical, a very important practical aspect. There will be like substantial amount of unbiased uh, uh, experts who will, if, they, if anyone approaches your poster, it means he or she is interested in your area and is expert in your area. You remember like some uh, people at the group meetings were uh, asking you questions. It will be sessions like this, maybe a little shorter, but you'll, you'll get some very inspiring questions. Sometimes you feel, uh, feel confused, but uh, it is really a uh, big jump start for com converting your posters into papers. And there is no doubt uh, question that posters are made only in order to make papers. It's just intermediate step. So uh, after you, people who will approach you, they will think that they interview you on your posters. But in fact, you are interviewing them on, on fresh ideas, thoughts, and, and feedbacks, and uh, ways to improve. OK? And uh, right after the poster session, instead of going to the pub, or maybe simultaneously just take a piece of paper and write down uh, anything you remember about uh, questions and answers. And then you can switch off your mind and uh, for, for another half a year, because <laughs> When you write paper, like introduction is automatic. You just uh, do copy paste, well, not literal copy paste, but you collect ideas from literature. When you do methods, they're standard. When you do conclusions, it is what it is. When uh, results, you just explain your figures. But discussion is most creative session section, and there you just copy paste your discussion with your peers at the poster. And then you have a like protocol to get paper in a at a no time. But this is only the private op opinion of several individuals. Do whatever pleases you, but just keep it in mind. Ready? You low battery and there's no. Um, what uh, what kind of plugin do you get? Oh. Nothing here. Yeah. No, it's an outlet. <laughs> Oh, if you pull yeah. this out, yeah, you have no idea how damage any of these are. How long would it stay? How many? Uh, it's at percent? 4%. Huh? It's at 4%. 4%? Not really. We have very limited time to find. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to practice the speed run of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just have Ben go Can first. you understand that any stuff you charge down the zone? Yeah. I don't give enough time for it to. Oh, here. Looks like an extension. I mean, everything is occupied. Yeah, I don't know which one makes the which. The data is the one plug from there. Then we do it. <laughs> So after this long introduction, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's charge your system and let Ben speak. <clears throat> I have email only from uh, president of the university. Are you sure you, you sent it? Would you open to send I sent it to the one that he emailed me. I have it on a flash drive. Okay, works. yeah, let's try it. Oh, yes, I see. It, it, it just was uh, delayed in transit. But if you... Maybe, let's compete. Maybe your first drive will be quick. I don't. Know. Let's go around the other side. Mm -hmm. 
So I guess a bit of preface, this is not going to be the longest presentation, um, mainly because the research is very incomplete and I don't have that much done, but I'm going to present what I have at the moment. So I am currently looking at the effects of pacification on cadmium selenium dye. Pacification? It's like pacific or pacifist? Pacification. So, is it mine? Passivation. No. Passivation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Probably should have used that word instead. But. Oh, it's cute, but. <laughs> 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 so, there are. So, the main idea is that, well, currently, maybe, currently what I'm working off of is. I am looking at three different, like, three different quantum dots, essentially, and that are all the same, just have a different structure, and, and working from there and seeing how that changes it, and also how, how the passivation changes it. So, this first category that we have is the PICRI, which is, which is the guy, which is the person that I got the systems from and pretty much who I picked it up from. And then the second, oh, punk. Yeah, punk. punk. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's just this, this is like what he's referred to in like all the metadata and stuff. So the second one is bulk, which is I took the bulk of cadmium selenium and then attached the dye. And then the third one is vast optimization, where I took the structures from a paper that Svetlana and company did a few years ago. And How much is the difference from the first one and third one? Um, basically where I got them, essentially. No, I mean, did you notice any difference or anything? Um, like, nothing too wild. I mean, you, if you look closely, you can notice some differences, but nothing exorbitant. And what I did is I passivated these in different ways and then optimized them. For example, here's some passivated systems. Um, this is bulk AC passivated, which refers to the fact that it's passivated on the A layer and the C layer, and it's passivated with topo, or which is tech, tetra, no, trioctal. Tetragonal? No, no. Trioctal Tri phosphine oxide. Yes. yes. Except they're modeled with just a methyl group instead of octal group. And so, and then here's the dye. The dye is a tripyridine with an osmium core and a um, carboxyl group. That's what so it's called. How did you perceive this? I mean, how many topo groups and why are they? Um, so here, um, well, it's on the A and C layer. And the A layer, I believe, has three and then six on the C layer, and then 
I did this, and then I did a second category where I protonated. Specifically, I protonated a cadmium, no, that's a selenium. I protonated a selenium atom very close to the dye. And <clears throat> so that, that's my optimizations. And then, so looking at energies, these are pulled directly from Gaussian and so are in atomic units. So passivation, no passivation. We have you know, mid negative 3000s, and then it increases once you passivate them, which makes sense. There isn't that much difference, like half of an atomic unit between the non-protonated and protonated, but that's, that's where similarities end, really. So, I don't know how much but I then, so. Would you allow to interrupt? Yes. So you're showing total energies? Yes, these and, are total uh, energies. I may have overslept a couple of slides, but <laughs> did you compute uh, binding energies, or maybe inherited mm. from anyone else? Uh, no, I do not have binding energies. But what, what is your opinion? My opinion? Not on the concept of binding energy, <laughs> but on, on the binding of your carboxylic group to, like, to each, um, you know, the rest, different chemical ways to, to bind. They both, both oxygen from carboxylic group may bind to one, let's say, cadmium, or they, each of them can, be, can bind to different cadmium, or one can bind and another can dangling in the, in the air. Can you go back and um, just, even if you were not analyzing before, just uh, tell so your instinct about it. Can't really get a good look, but here you can get a better look. So, like, I guess the intention was to get the oxygens to bind to two different cadmiums on the And in fact, upon optimization, um, it appears that it, it appears to have done as such. That being bind to two different cadmiums. Maybe. Two different cadmiums. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what would be your expectation for binding energy, even if you if you never computed yourself and never looked on data of others, would it be order of magnitude? Um, I I don't I really don't have a baseline for like what's strong and what's weak. And uh, you can would, uh, expect someone in, in audience to give you little like hints. Like, yeah, I I would imagine that it's more strong than weak. Okay, but uh, what's a typical energy of, of binding? What were the data by Alisa when she was? Um, I have not looked at any of the data. But she was showing it on oh, the She was screen. showing it. Yes. I don't I, I, I always slip uh, slides very <laughs> often myself, so it's, it's fine. <laughs> So sh should it be more or less than electron volt? I'll take a gander and say more. Okay. But you can be very r relaxed and tell like of the order of one electron volt. <laughs> so um, the comparison to look at is uh, to compute binding energy and, and compare with the thermal energy okay. of at room temperature, which is very small. It's like 2-3% two, two, of the electron volt. And anything above this value will uh, approximately mean that it is stable, chemically stable binding. Okay. So do not, exact numbers and details are uh, also important, but not uh, as a first thing. You can just roughly tell, like, I do see numerical evidence that it is a stable binding. Please keep going, sir. Okay. So, total energy.
energies again. So next is DOS. Um, I don't really know how accurate it is because it seems not that consistent. So I computed DOS for bulk and the BASP optimiz optimized ones. So for the AC pacified, AC pacified protonated, and no pacification. So we're use. No, no, this is a similar question. So what is zero? One question, one question, two, where is Fermi energy? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and question number three, they all are like uh, entangled. It's one big question. And which orbitals or which part of this uh, electronic structure represent occupied orbitals and which are unoccupied? So the zero is right here. And I do believe that the zero uh, splits occupied and unoccupied. Um, yeah. What is the line rate you're using? Uh, this. I remember like. I think this is like point two, point zero two five. But I, I ask you to use the point one. That's why you got a very sharp peak. Okay. Point well, point two. one, like, it looked way too broad, to me. Right. Broad. Oh, broad. Okay. So I but tried a few yeah. different ones, and this one looked. Um, so why do you think that is not inconsistent? What are your expectations? What do you think? Um. Well, I expected the unpacified ones to not have a very large band gap, I guess, and the bulk one didn't have a very large band gap, but the VASP one had a band gap even larger than this one. And so, and I expected these to look a lot similar. I expected, you know, in the columns, them to look similar. Did you be able to take the fragmented dose? Uh, yeah, that's the next slide. Okay. So. I guess there's no reason not to. So red is the quantum dot, blue is the die, and T is the topo. So green is the topo. And so I, I got different results. Um, so this is from negative 10 to 10. So it's kind of hard to see the band gap, but you can you can see it. But again, the, the bulk, no pacified, there there is no band gap. There's no gap at all. But so the problem is seems like in the red line. Red in the bulk, no pacification. So the quantum dot. Quantum dot, yeah. yeah. So maybe something wrong on the optimization. This quantum dots it didn't optimize correctly. Just, I guess since I don't have a, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a conclusion page. So I guess I'll make a few observations um, because I don't have any formal conclusions because I'm far from done but you know just upon initial inspection um, protonation of the quantum dot causes an increase in the band gap you can see from <coughs> here to here and from here to here the band gap is bigger and it looks it looks like the overall density of states is sensitive to the exact um, shape of the quantum dot, I guess. Because so I'm 
I'm just wondering if you compare the dogs with uh, these dogs. Uh, in it's, this case, it's not all, similar at all. <laughs> yeah, so something is wrong. Yeah, because they have no band gap. It's closed band gap, or they have, maybe they have no band gap. Something in here. But in dogs, you saw they have a wide gap here. Yeah. There is a different X axis compared to the PDOS and DOS, but I, I didn't notice that until it was a bit late to change it for today. Question? Yes. Or let's upload a button for, for the I don't know if you ever talked about it, but what does it mean to passivate something? I don't really uh, know what that term to is. Passivate simply means to, like, like here there's different, so there's, there's the quantum dot, and each of the atoms on the quantum dot have different number of bonds, and essentially what we're doing is we are filling up the bonds of the cadmiums by attaching these these topo molecules to them. Is so passivate is an action opposite to activate? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but make makes it non reactionary. Okay. But, well, why would you want to make something not reactive? Because this it is a quantum dot, it's a very small volume yeah. but high surface, so it's too reactive. Too it's not able oh. to, it's need to stabilize, so that's why you need to passive the surface. Oh, okay, I didn't know that quantum dots were naturally reactive, extremely. Well, the transition metals, uh, do you see them often yes, as isolated ions? Do you, do you see any compounds where, well, not compounds, do you see Transition metals like flying in the air. Not, not really. Like inorganic materials are usually just in the middle of the core, right? Yes, because the, the uh, organic shell passivate them because they, they, on on their own they would react with something. And if you activate, if you have a metal organic complex and tear off one leg of this bug, <laughs> uh, there is a missing bond. You activate it, and then it can work as a catalyst. If you look what people do in the uh, lab or chemistry lab or uh, engine, they, they, they have catalysts or this metal organic complex form temporary bonds and then activate some organic reactions. So transition metals, even if they are part of this quantum dot, they are active. And you do not want them to be active. The role of the quantum dot in this application is not chemical reaction, so you wanted to make them passive. Uh, there you go. Yes. That helps. Yeah, that helps. So, um, what is self-healing? Self-healing? Yes. Like, in reference to this? Or? Yeah, absolutely. No, no. As <laughs> <laughs> as <we go. laughs> Let me, like, put stitches on a wound. <laughs> Um, no clue. Let's go to honest. your density of states. Ah. Kind of. Oh. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, bulk without passivation. Bulk without passive. Yes. yes. Where is the gap? How big is the gap? Um, the gap is non existent. Okay, why? Um, I it, 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 it relates to question by Daniel. I guess because it's very reactive. And yes, and what does it mean very reactive on the language of electronic structure? I I guess it means that 
um, the there's a lot of electrons in the states near the Homo and Limo? Uh, yes, there are occupied and unoccupied states almost at any energy. So this uh, compound can either donate or withdraw electron from any neighbor that you come. And uh, if you, um, you guys can correct me, I can say something stupid because I never took chemistry, even freshman. But you know, th there are like um, new structures it does something when you. What know, kind of structures? Lewis. 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 Yes. Yeah, Lewis structure. Lewis. Okay. Lewis. 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 Lewis structure. Lewis. Yes. Okay. When you when you like draw compound and then you draw like little ears of a bunny and tell like those are uh, electron pairs, right? We use dots. But dots. Yeah. And and sometimes you circle each pair of dots. By it, you have this right. Yeah, in, in your Lewis structures. Okay, so there are, um, if, if there is a active, non-passivated transition metal on the surface, then it has some uh, lone electron pairs that would participate in two reaction if some stranger will come nearby. And on electronic structure and on the doors, this lone uh, pairs would correspond to populating uh, gap area by uh, occupied and unoccupied states. Okay. So this is a probably good catalyst, but it is not a good uh, light emitter or substance to absorb light and, and give charge transfer. And uh, can you point one figure down? Yes. yes. What is the gap here? Um, the gap is almost one electron volt. How come? It is the same chemical composition. Um, I have no idea. Any, because any intuitive? Anyone? Why gap is so? Why gap opens upon optimization? Well, because there's a it's quantum. They have no. Without without any evidence. Because of, because of confinement, I think. Mm -mm. No. Um, what I suspect that the bulk and optimize, it means not the presence or absence of confinement. I suspect, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you have the same number of atoms, same size of confinement, but uh, in the bulk, it means that symmetry of interatomic distance literally follows as it was in bulk, in bulk yeah. and uh, was optimized when the atoms rearrange. I guess it's so. optimized in Gaussian, right? So, uh, yes. Matter. Also, it doesn't matter the last of those. So, um, yeah, the bulk is optimized, and so it goes out of the bulk structure. It's just, it started as bulk, as opposed to starting as the structure that I pulled from the paper. Mm -hmm. So bulk is uh, very symmetric. You probably have this. Um, I, so... I have up. Oh, so next, this next is before. one one before one before. Um, this this is before. Okay. Your optimization. So, so the, the the bulk. This is before optimization. Yes, okay. and it is what shows field gap, right? The gap with no. many active states. No, I no? guess I didn't really label this well okay. because. Yeah, I guess I would need to rename it when I present this further, but. Huh. So what, uh, this middle picture, uh, no. it is what uh, you it show. what I optimized. Okay, and the next one? This, this is also what I, op this is a different structure that I optimized. Okay, so you, you optimized both? Yes. And you report density of states up after optimization? Yes. How long do you optimize? Do you until it finishes. Until it converges or until it uh, f just runs out of compute hours? Um, until Gaussian says that it's done. Huh. Okay. Then I can withdraw some of my comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like here you can kind of see 
like what the bulk looks like. It does have a bit of symmetry, but it's not like bulk, mm -hmm. like what it was originally. So. There was some confusion about the script, uh, how he plot the dolls. So we just look on that, but we didn't figure it out. Okay. So that's maybe an yeah. issue of plotting this, not only just confusion. Okay. But uh, generally, it is a concept accepted in the community that uh, if you compute electronic structure without optimization, then it, uh, the uh, gap will be filled. And upon uh, optimization, the states will disappear, partially disappear from the gap area, because uh, there will be formation structure surface re uh, restructurization. Uh, surface reorganization. Fatima is the right word that people have in surface chemistry. Surface reconstruction. Okay, okay. reconstruction. And upon this reconstruction, atoms on the surface uh, bind to each other and uh, erase uh, this uh, lone electron pairs. And this mechanism opens the gap. So some people call it self healing, and your results seem very similar to. To this, even if they are not. <laughs> More questions to Ben. If no, we thank you once again. Do you give you a charge now? Yeah, it should be fine. And I have your slides on this one as well. You discovered that there is not enough charge. The only participant in the conference. Huh. It means someone was connected. Maybe Brady. Is he still in Los Alamos or he's in, in, the, in the road? Yeah, good point. Oh, it was me. Oh, I disconnected. <laughs> um, so while you're setting up, I'll continue entertaining the audience. Uh, did any of you registered for uh, National Science Foundation? Oh, he, uh, Daniel is a champion in other aspects as well. Uh -huh. And so question is primarily to Vandal. Did you register for NSF uh, grant writing? No. It's your choice and your decision, but it is really, um, it could be beneficial. It's a course how to get money for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, and by the end of the course, you submit true proposal, which will give you like 40k per year for the rest of your graduate school if you decide to go to it. That would be all right. <laughs> but uh, it, it needs uh, to, to register. Uh, if Daniel is interested, he, he knows what is uh, the code for the course? Uh, not, not from the top of the head, but you may uh, see it. It's maybe like either English 400 or University 400 something. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you sent me an email about it a while back, so I can could, I could just find that. Yep, and it, it's just one hour per week, so it shouldn't take all of your time. Does it work? How long do you have to talk here? 15 minutes? Uh, more like, like including 13, questions? 12, 13. Okay. 13 minutes? Oh. Okay. I think it is yours. some motion.
it tries to, to, to update the resolution. from the PC. Would it be okay? Let me just try one more. Yeah. Thing. Maybe you're lucky. For five seconds. At this point, I don't know. Can you report it? No? Huh? Is it okay? Material? Yes. Well, now since Stefan is playing for the US Cup, but it is like not much more expensive. Well, she's not here. I understand. Just give a summary of my conclusions. Yes, please, please. It uh, will help. You should do that when you actually give the talk. I probably <laughs> will. <laughs> well, there is, there is no negative uh, advertisement. Anything that attracts attention. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about uh, photophysics and specifically excited state dynamics and a lead halide perovskite nanocrystal. And this is just a quick summary of the results that we got. So the main observable in lead halide perovskites is a photoluminescence quantum yield. And that is the main observable we attempt to try to compute and model for their simulations. And for that, you need to have your non radiative and radiative recombination rates. and just for the heck of it, well, along the way we would compute a carrier cooling in the systems as well. And we find that radiative and cooling agree pretty well with the experiment, while our uh, non-radiative relaxation is uh, a little bit quicker than what's seen experimentally. So with that, I'm gonna slow you the keyboard. I think it's one more slide anyway. That's a nice video. So just a quick uh, brief overview of how we designed our study. So we know we want to model a nanocrystal. So the basic parameters you can change are size, surface termination, and solvent effects. And for non-radiative relaxation in crystals, it's the ligands are important for that. So that's what we mostly focus on for our modeling. And since we're dealing with nanocrystals, it's basically limited to DFT or TDDFT, anything 
Our higher level theory is pretty much just because it'll take too long for excited state dynamics. So we use DFT, and then it's known that there is strong spin orbit coupling in these perovskite crystals, so we have to use a non-collinear approach with spin orbit coupling. And then we use GGA functional. And we'll explain why we do that later. And so here is the model that we built for a lead halide perovskite nanocrystal. So you can see in the middle, it's basically a two by two by two uh, unit cell with the perovskite crystal structure. And this is about 99 atoms. So 27 lead, 54 bromine, and then eight cesiums in the middle. And generally there's two ways that these nanocrystals are passivated. You can either have uh, carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids and uh, oleoamines passivated, or you can have uh, oleoamine halides. In this case, we choose the carboxylic acid and the amines to coordinate each of the surfaces. And then each atom is passivated, so you expect this is a fully passivated system we should get near unity photoluminescence quantum yields in these systems. And so here is a plot of the what density states where we compute. So we use a spin over coupling basis with a PBE functional. And in these systems, it's known that if you just use GGA functional with spin restricted, you get roughly correct band gaps. So for a system our size, which is about one and a half nanometers, we get, if you just use spin restricted, you get about a three electron volt uh, band gap, which follows from the effective mass approximation. But when you include spin orbit coupling, you get like a 0.7 EV uh, reduce in your band gap. So, and that's what we see here. So, at the end of the day, we get a qualitatively correct band gap for what you'd see in experiment for these systems around 2.4 EV, which is important for radiative and non radiative calculations because it depends on the energy spacing or the band gap. And so it's generally known that the conduction band is composed of six or less six p orbitals, and the valence band is a uh, halide p orbitals um, hybridized with uh, lead success. So, but the question is, what do the ligands do, or how do they contribute to the system? So this is a plot of the dense partial density states. The black curve is the full density states, which we saw previously, and red is the halide p contributions. Green is the 6S contributions. Pink is the ligand contribution, which is fully basically from the 2P or orbitals of the oxygen. And in the valence band, we see basically a little hybridization within this region. So in, here's just an image of the orbitals. You can see the hybridization of the oxygens with the lead and the bromines. And an interesting note is pretty much all the ligand or all the hybridized states come from the oxygen. That we don't see any hybridization of the amines, which you kind of unexpected. And so that's the ground state electronic structure. And the main thing we want to compute is excited state dynamics. So to do that, we use our uh, geometry optimized ground state structure as input for our excited state dynamics. So essentially, what we do is we model a photo excitation. And then along a trajectory, we compute our rates between interband non radiative brace between transitions. So in time, you get cooling to the band edge. And then on another time scale, you get the non radiative relaxation across the band gap of the electron and hole. And to do this, we uh, do a molecular dynamic trajectory to couple the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. And then at each time step, we compute uh, non adiabatic couplings on the fly using spin orbit basis, which is shown in the bottom here. And then we take process those non adiabatic couplings into state to state rates. And just to kind of a, give a brief overview of how we this methodology works. So we just consider an orbital window from LUMO to LUMO plus five. You have all the possible transitions, which you can label here. You can label those into like a matrix. So this would be like from LUMO plus one to LUMO, LUMO plus two to LUMO, so on and so forth. And then if you imagine this as each one of these squares is of amplitude and rotated it. This would give these would give the probabilities of transitions or the transition rates between the states, and that is basically what the next figure plots here. So this is called our, our red field tensor. So this block up here computes interband transitions for the conduction band between for electrons, and then these compute uh, uh, hole relaxation rates in the, va in the valence band. And so you can characterize each of these trends, which I'll just skip. For brevity in this space. So once you compute your red field tensors, if you assume that the 
non-radiative relaxation occurs primarily across the gap in the homolumo states. You can just use the, the matrix element corresponding to homolumo as your non-radiative relaxation rate, and we get a rate of about one inverse nanoseconds, which is a little bit high compared to what's been inferred from experiments. So they infer that the non-radiative relaxation rate is about two to three orders magnitude less than what we calculate, and I'll comment on that when we get back to the conclusions. And so those are our state-to-state -state rates. And then for, since we're doing a dynamics calculation, you need uh, initial conditions. So this is what's being plotted here. So this is where we, we model photo excitation, which we compute from oscillator strengths. One of the higher ones is from this state here to this state here. So homo minus 9 to lumo plus 10, which is about a 3 EV transition. So it's something realistic. And then this figure here plots the dynamics in time for energy. So the x-axis is log time, so 0 is 1 picosecond, negative 3 is a femtosecond. Y-axis is energy, with 0 is a Fermi energy. So you can see the electron, we have initial photo excitation, and over time, the electron dissipates some of its energy to the lattice vibrations, and then it uh, cools to the band edge. And the dotted line just represents average energy over the trajectory, and same for the hole. And for, breath, or for simplicity, we assume that, that these rates to single exponential fit, so we compute cooling rates to the band edge corresponding to about four to eight inverse picoseconds, which agrees pretty well with experiment, where most experiments they see is around 300, uh, or three inverse picoseconds, or 300 femtoseconds. So we use a single, we approximate this as a single exponential, but you could suspect that in the conduction band, for the electron, there's a strong spin orbit coupling, so that's going to introduce big subgaps. And if you have big subgaps, that's not going to follow a single exponential fit very well. So to look into that, we modeled this red dotted line is what our uh, single exponential fit would be, and the solid line is what we actually compute for the dynamics. And for the spin, or, or spin orbit basis, you can see that up at, to about uh, 100 picoseconds, there's a very quick decay in the valence band edge, but over time, due to this big subgap, about 2 EV, between LUMO plus 1 and LUMO, there's a very much lower decay going on. And if you compare that to if you just did a spin-restricted calculation with no spin orbit coupling, you see it, uh, it's about two orders of magnitude quicker, just because there's, we don't see that big subgap occurring in here primarily. So take home message of spin orbit coupling is important if you're trying to model non-ready to or cooling rates for these systems. And so we can visualize these dynamics. So before we were just looking at energy relaxation. And here you can, uh, we spatially project the orbitals onto a 2D slice of our perovskite nanocrystal. So as time goes forward, you can see that there's slight changes in the orbitals occurring. So these blue lobes are the 6P, the yellow, I take that back, the yellow lobes are the 6P, and the blue lobes and spheres correspond to the bromine halide 6P. You can see the cooling rate for the hole to like the S orbitals, which would be in the center. And how much time do I have? Two minutes. Oh, so I enough time. So, so that was non-radiative transitions in the conduction band, but you can also have possibility radiative transitions, or intraband transitions that can compete with the non-radiative, and we can compute those along the trajectories. If you just compute uh, oscillator strengths between all the bands, so if you compute oscillator strengths, you can get uh, rates from the Einstein coefficients. And along the trajectory, we don't see too much interesting. You see that there's a low energy heat intraband transitions given off, and then after you relax to the band edge, you see uh, bright peel coming from the system. And so to get our non-radiative rate to wrap up our, you get our photoluminous, photoluminescence quantum yield, you can assume that it's primarily from the homo lumo. And we compute that rate to be about uh, 0.4 inverse nanoseconds, which is a little underestimated compared to theory and experiment for uh, ultra, like ultra cold experiments or in a vacuum. Or, 0k measurement, that's what I'm trying to say. But it gives a pretty real, realistic result. And so if we plug everything into our photoluminescence quantum yield, we get 33%, uh, which is 
in right order of magnitude. That's usually what we try to take home at the end of the day as a computationalist for something this size. And you can see that this mostly comes from the non rate of being kind of overestimated a little bit. And so to wrap up, the big thing that we see is a two order, three order magnitude larger non rate of relaxation than expected. And one thing that this could be compared to is we only looked at one of the like, prominent search for passivations in these systems. If you consider the other one where it was the um, uh, um, alum, ammonium halide, and it's generally if you have a halide passivation, it's been seen in the literature that that reduces non radiative relaxation. So it could be that uh, this surface passivation is ill equipped for. Uh, for getting high luminescence yields out of these systems. And so with that, acknowledgements, go in, clean group, people who I give you resources and money. And it's the shameless plug for my poster that I'm also presenting this afternoon as well. So with that, I'll take questions. Okay, let's thank everyone. Did he match in time? Yeah, you were within like 10, yeah, 20 seconds, 10, so. Yeah. Up at 15 minutes? Up 12 minutes. Oh. Um, and that, that's good, that's good. Uh, uh, big speakers before and after will take your time, so it's good that you, <laughs> you're ready. And better let audience to roast you with questions. I put a time on each slide here, so you can take a look on which slide you spend how long. That'll be helpful. Any questions? Or suggestions for to make it better or worse? So, um, what are typical, you already told it, but uh, what are typical quantum yields on experiment? Hmm. So, uh, wait, 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 I, I'm okay. going to one point. And uh, if they are off from your results, who is wrong and why? That's what I was trying. Well, that's what I was trying to get at. It. Uh, with this part being overestimated, so typically with like freshly synthesized, these things emit around, you can get them up near 90% quantum yields, and then over time they may go down to like 50%. So what we calculated here would be considered like a bad emitter for Proskech standards. So, and that's, Mostly attribute to this non radiative relaxation rate being too big because if you just look at the equation, it's basically just one number divided by the sum of numbers. And this number is the same order of magnitude as the radiative relaxation, so it's going to be around 50% for photol photoluminescence quantum yields, anyway. So, what I think is happening. Is that an experiment? You get you get two different surface passivations. If you just replace these guys with the uh, bromine coming out, and then there's been some reports in the literature of halide terminated surfaces having significantly lower photoluminous or non radiative recombination rates, or helping to uh, promote slower non radiative recombinations, which kind of makes sense because. Basically, you're replacing this oxygen, which is a higher frequency vibration. But then if you put a halide there, it's bigger and slower, so it's not going to vibrate as much. So it gives not less non-adiabatic coupling. So you expect that to lower the non-radiative rate across the gap by, I mean, if it did an order of magnitude, that would increase this number to like 70%, which is you would see in experiment. Any other reasons? I forgot the question. Any other reasons for discrepancy? You mentioned uh, the um, oh, um, surface, surface terminated by halides. Yeah, and there's also GGA functional, which is kind of underestimates or it overestimates gaps between states a little bit. So. Someone published a paper on that a while ago, and I think the take-home message was it's like one order, like two to four times slower. So it would improve our rates a little bit if we use like a hybrid functional. But then again, that's going to change our gap too. Someone, you mean Akimov? Akimov, yeah. He'll probably be.
be there, so we should probably Q. say his name. But so so that's another issue. Then there's also what is the typical size of experimental from uh, Sky Dose? Oh, they're yes, they're usually like ten nanometers, ten to eight, and ours is <coughs> five, so it's mostly surface. So basically, all we're measuring is surface effects or majority surface effects instead of the little bit of bulk material that's on the inside or the outside. So could it be more uh, enhanced, enhanced surface effects in your uh, results that are responsible for discrepancy from experiment? I mean, because, because of the uh, uh, size is basically by order of magnitude or half of order of magnitude. You're doing one nanometer and the experiment is like five to ten. Yeah, but I would expect that to impact the cooling rates more than the not radiative, okay. just because, <coughs> yeah, you'd have to scale those the same. Mm -hmm. so, if, so if you assume that if we made a bigger model, it would decrease the rate across the gap, that would slow down our cooling rates mm -hmm. too, so. It may also increase the density of the state and then increase the coupling yeah, that's the state. Yeah, that's true too. So you, you, you may want to create a backup slides with uh, listing all sources of discrepancy. If no one asks, you do not need to show your weak spots. Mm -hmm. Then Rashba effect, just because, well, if you get the chance to say Rashba effect, you just, you just should, because people will blame Rashba for, for everything. Yeah. yeah. That is my question, too. What is Rashba effect? I've never heard of it. So it's the coupling of like electronic spin to your crystal structure. What kind of spin, sorry? So like electron spin, oh, yeah, so yeah. up or down spin. It couples to the, the crystal lattice, like any sort of fields produced in there. And then the take home message is it usually slows down on ready to the combination because you need a little bit more energy to recombine. Thank you for that. You, you were about to ask something. Sorry for cut, cutting. Was I? <laughs> or maybe you were scratching like. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was probably just doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we go to the slide where you show the red field tensor? Probably I just didn't pay attention, so. Why you show the table? Um, right corner, yeah. To give people a better idea. Maybe it doesn't help, I don't know. But maybe, like, it's hard to visualize what each of these blocks mean. So if you project it like, along one of the axes, it's like this would be your homo minus one to homo transition. Oh, okay. Homo minus two. So it's just a one dimensional or 2D plot to simplify things instead of a. 3D. Okay, well, I guess maybe you need to explicitly state that, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So it's like zoom in into this bigger field. Mm -hmm. Projected red field tensor. What's well, projected uh, red field tensor uh, is a uh, very specific terminology, maybe specific up to one person in the world. Uh, I kind of hope these white lines kind of helped or people would connect. Dots at this this big bar is this one the smaller ones or this one? But yeah, maybe I'll just take it out to. Or, or you could just leave it in and it'll provoke questions. Yeah. Or you can t uh, like finger it with either your pointer or your sexual finger and tell like if you zoom into this white area, maybe maybe you told it, but uh, I don't think I think I just skipped it just because I was pressing for time. It might help if you flip the order, because like, if you kind of imagine, you know, projecting that on there, it seems like that's kind of the opposite direction of how it would go, right? If you were to just kind of like slide that up there, because you're kind of you're looking at the other face of it from the way that you're projecting. Yeah, I don't know. That's worked though. It's true. <laughs> I also have a question about the slide you show the single exponential feed.
So what's the point of this slide? Um, to show what's well, kind of cut off here just because of the, of the issue we had having earlier. But you see, they both show like similar decay within like up to minus 100 scale, but not even minus one. But they show similar decay like with around negative two. And then once it gets closer to the pan gap, there's an extended decay tail. So I'm just showing that compared between spinner, spinner orbitals that we use, spin restricted, you're gonna get like a two order of magnitude difference just based on the energy differences in the density of states. I'm not sure if this kind of comparison makes sense. So the initial condition is different, right? Uh, I tried to make them, like this is the biggest transition I had for the spin restricted, so it's 0.3 EV. This one's like 0.4 EV. But I guess that still doesn't change the fact that you still see this really long decay. Can, can you see that we, uh, this heat and time dependence will not change substantially if you excite the couple of states higher or couple of states lower? Right. But how about the orbital? Like, oh, in addition to initial condition, how about the intermediate states? So the charge density distribution is also the same for spin, spin polarized and uh, SOC. Um, I guess that I can comment comment on. But what I can tell you is, non-radiative rates they're inversely proportional to like the energy difference. So if you have a big energy difference, you're gonna have a slower rate. So and that's kind of what this is showing here, whereas. Like this is probably, I don't know, within room temperature spacing between these energy states. So you see much quicker decay to the band edge. Did, the question, did I ever answer the question you asked? Or? Yes. I guess it's also important yes. to in another sense, because experimentally, and I think it was crystal, you know, crystal like thin films, they saw or they observed um, like emission above the band gap for, it wasn't for bromide systems, but for iodine. So you, if you were trying to model that, like emission above the gap, like this is really important because you have to have a longer lifetime in like your LUMO plus three, your LUMO plus two states. So what's your conclusion from this slide? So the take home message is to model carrier cooling in these systems, you have to have spin orbit coupling. Otherwise you get way too quick rates. So basically you're telling, look at me, I can do spin orbit. Pretty much, yeah. That's why, that's why I showed the first slide too, showing that that's, I guess I didn't mention it, but we compute excited state dynamics with spin orbit coupling and not a lot of people can do that or haven't done it yet anyway. And, and this is not, uh, small perturbation to overall answer you, you see major consequences of taking into account spin spinner. Yeah, almost two orders of magnitude. Like this tail extends out to like 0.5 out here on the time scale. So it's basically two orders. Comments, any suggestions on the style of slides? Like if you're uh, not comfortable with size of fonts, or yeah, I try not to pack too much into it, but... Who are you presenting these to normally, mainly? People smarter than me. People smarter than <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, I, I just want to know what the crowd was, like if they were just a like, group of engineers. Professionals, the person who discovered these. Oh. He's talking right before me. <laughs> 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 um, well, I, I have a single question. It, it doesn't affect any science. Why do you put titles on the bottom rather than on the top? I don't know. I just liked it like that. Okay. Is uh, everyone fine with this? This is okay. Because it's kind of not a main title. It's kind of slide title. If you anybody want to go 
you know, like my yeah, my main titles I put on top. Yeah. And now you don't have to strain your neck as much to look and do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can start like, I care about your necks. <laughs> oh, you old people. <laughs> Anything? Any slides uh, to remove, or maybe something is missing? Any slides to add? If uh, Aaron will be first and the only speaker about perovskites, maybe one could add like three slides of introduction where they are. But right. there will there will be speakers before him, so. It's Probably justified to be so technical. Mm -hmm. What is your talk? Tuesday after lunch. Okay. Can you write it down uh, in the title? No, it is Tuesday after lunch. <laughs> Welcome to my talk. <laughs> Just in case if uh, a stranger came and told me. Well, I, I, I don't care, but, but many people, I don't know it's right or wrong, but many people, maybe for, uh, it, it is a notice to retarded ones. Uh, on the first slide, they tell which conference it is, which talk it is, and even what time is it. <laughs> it is pretty common, I guess, yeah. I saw in many, but, but time is like in automatic in, in, in uh, PowerPoint. So they updated time. No, 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 time, not like what time is uh, literally, but like uh, uh, schedule, schedule time for beginning of the talk. Or maybe co like you, at the last slide, you put the code of your poster, mm -hmm. but you may put code of your talk uh, at, at the beginning. Because th there are, if maybe someone wanted to go to different uh, session, and uh, or specifically to this session and watch for your talk and look in. I wanted to look for this talk. Oh no, no, I do not want. I better leave. Yeah, I could fit that in my green box. Good. Yeah. You can work on acknowledgement slide. I mean, in acknowledgement slide, you can put some picture like your, your group picture or this picture. I don't think we have a group picture. Can make one, but it's not primary thing. Uh, do you <laughs> so the have you seen idea. talks by uh, Dr. Hogan? No. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. You on, did? A, on the I forgot the which conference. Uh, to the regional. Oh no, not that. Mm -hmm. We should make him As to, to, to yeah. present uh, departmental seminar. He starts telling what uh, North Dakota is, how it is connected to Game of Thrones, and winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't need to do it, it's just... Uh, he's after me, so he can... Okay. <laughs> he's stealing his material. <laughs> <laughs> like Dr. Klimov's talk in the cinema. Dr. Klimov talk. But he he, he should the enchant en 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 figure, and then with the quantum doors thing. How the cost of breathing everything. Can we go to slide number seven? Yes. Do you think this slide is necessary? Um, maybe not absolutely necessary. I just put it in there to explain what the red field tensor is. Because it seems like nobody looks like. People probably haven't looked at it before, and if they knew that basically this represents state-to-state -state transitions, if you laid it out like this, from here to here, then to here, they might get it. Maybe in a short time, no one will be able to follow this slide, but uh, if someone wants to percept everything, it's probably useful. In, in slide six, so what is the EO meaning is exciton is relaxing through the state or it just a particle electron and hole? Just electron and hole relaxed through the band gap. It's, well, this is probably a little bit of propaganda. 
because we yeah. compute them. No, I'm just wondering we... why you put the both in the ocean and the whole both the same place. It's, it's kind of it's like it look like it, they are moving together as excited and they're relaxing to the still they are excited. It's kind of like that. So f physically, it, it kind of correct, but uh, literally it is deceptive because uh, mm -hmm. there is no bound exit on in, in this world. Right. Like I said, it's kind of propaganda, but I guess... Would it be easy if instead of electron and hole, if you put just hole or just electron, then in... And it's relaxing well, to he, the he knows how to answer if someone picks him. No, 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 it, it, it's only propaganda. The actual results are much simpler. <laughs> 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 and if... Uh, well, I, I agree that I probably would do a separate electron going down, hole going up, but then... Uh, Aaron would need to change his yeah. first and last slides because he's no, using mean, his own uh, pictographical language of this uh, blue and orange uh, circles. So mm -hmm. I guess you don't need the both electron and hole. You can show just one as an example. This is just as an example, maybe, right? Yeah, how is relaxing. Do you think uh, it is critical to change it or optional? Uh, I guess it's optional because it's like it's not your research slide, so maybe you will... Still, it's a little bit misleading. It is. Yeah. It, is it is misleading. It is misleading. Mm -hmm. well, I guess the big thing I tried to show is this way is time. So you get cooling at one time, and then a little bit, then later you get non radiative relaxation. And also, you yeah, can't do that with yeah. the band picture. But this is not the care cooling, right? Yeah. I mean, is. No, I well, mean, this. The, uh, this uh, What's it called? Carby, car, what's it called? It's car, 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 car liberator, yeah. What? Why you, what is this car liberator? You meaning this one to this one? Is it it's time cool? interval for cooling. Time but interval. Like the, so this is like one, like some relaxation, mm -hmm. some more energy dissipation. So you're kind of supposed to think of this as like... This is a time, right? Yes, we are assumed to be mind readers and understand that it is a time line. It is not labeled, but... Okay. Maybe explicitly writing that it is a time would be helpful. Or maybe cooling because it's a, it's kind of, isn't it a uh, rate instead of K? Yeah, but you can get your rate from the time interval. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. So it's. Maybe I should explain just this figure more. Mm -hmm. I'm going through. And also, I'm not, maybe I don't understand this way. Either. So in the first photon, I mean, is a blue car. So you're showing this absorption process, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's relaxing to that ground state. Our EG is gap, energy gap. Mm -hmm. Then why you put the photon here, uh, H, H mu, the energy M mu, yeah, a blue H because we model a photo excited relaxation. So this is like our initial condition. Okay, so this is the ground state, right? EG. Are we excited? It is a front orbital or ground state? Okay, so your so point is exciting above point the should gap. be below right. EG. So this arrow should yeah. be down more, I guess. Yeah, then H mu should be larger than this one, right? This is not the H mu. Right. Maybe I'll just say this is gap and... Yeah, so the AEG is a front orbital, maybe, right? Yeah, Lumo, Homo, mm -hmm. Lumo and Homo, yeah. Energy difference between Yeah. Them. So H mu is not, it's not H mu here, maybe. Really. Yeah, technically you picked it all apart, mm -hmm. I guess. So I guess it would be better if you, if you add another line below the EG, is exciting from that line, and then electron is relaxed to the EG. Yeah. Is it the better line? I would have to rearrange all this stuff. I guess, I guess you can do that because they have a space to add another line. I guess it would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's better to... If you have something like this? Oh. 
Yeah, there's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, electron holes separate, yeah. separate and then we're combining mm -hmm. it. So it is exciting from the balance band and relax to the low mode with low mode. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if time allows, uh, if, you yeah. have, if you have mm -hmm. nothing to do on, on a plane or if talks before you will be boring. If, if you think that you don't have a space in the slide, so you can just add one line, you don't need to show the hole, just show the electrons. Came to the easy. Now I'm just trying to remember how many times I show this thing. Maybe just six. I guess only once. So. Yeah, it wouldn't be too much work. To, but that'd be the only slide I'd have to change. More questions? Then uh, let's thank Aaron once again. Uh, let him collect uh, comments, written comments for improvements. And uh, have a safe travel. I have a quick question on the slide for actually. It's not a question, I'm just one like to draw a quick figure. Is it four? Yeah, slide four. Or use it. One, two. This one? Yeah. So what is the E for me? Is that because energy. E for me is not any is is it related to the front of it? Right? Is that you mean or uh so, so for me for me energy is positive here. I think so. This is fine, but I wouldn't advertise it widely. All right. It's, it's, it, it, most likely it is not wrong, but it is not typical. It was just the energy I, or the value that I had to shift it from the... Yes, yes. Oh. But, uh, so uh, absolute value of that, plus or minus, absolute. I don't remember. So you can keep it on uh, extra slide or on a side if someone asks you. I just so positive, positive Fermi energy uh, is not something to... Even if it is correct, if it is not something to brag about. Hmm. It would be... Uh, I would have to... I'm trying to remember. Well, if, it would be if it would be minus 1.73, then you can keep it. But I guess it's not necessary to read the for me. Is there data to for me? Yeah. Any discussion in this slide? This energy for me information? The label. It just will have like, uh, I guess. Oh, I mean like the x-axis label. As a gap is important, but this for me is not important in this discussion. Yes. You can it yes, correct. What is 238 in nanometers? Like 5, 10. 12, 40 divided by 2.38. Yeah, well, um, you may... It, it's not necessarily not necessary to, to show it, but you can verbally tell it. Mm -hmm. it for those who are from experimental background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because specifically from for Maxim. Okay. So we are done. Looks like it. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, have a safe trip to the conference. <laughs>